I thought that it was worth it to look into this moment to kind of undo the reductive tale that had been sort of put forth, which was like, this is the fight between Blacks and Jews, between Blacks and whites, and kind of unfurl that a little bit. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, after all of the discourse in 2020 in the wake of George Floyd about the sort of racial reckoning and this, all of the sort of language we heard about, like, you know, these conversations about American race and racial equity and white supremacy and reforming or abolishing even in some corners policing and in empirical terms, like as far as we can tell, unprecedented level of street protest that we've never seen in American history. You know, when you take stock two years later, it feels like we're in, like that felt like an, a kind of high watermark moment of sort of possibility for progressive change that felt true through different parts in the Trump years, 2017 and like Me Too particularly felt like a moment of like radical possibility opening up around gender equity and, and, and patriarchy. And now that I'm 43, like, and have been, you know, covering politics for long enough, I've been around the carousel enough to know that, like, there are moments that feel full of progressive possibility, and then there are reactionary moments that feel like where the worst sort of forces feel more ascendant. And, you know, I felt that post 9-11 in the U.S. is one example, particularly in the run-up to the Iraq war, you know, coming out of Barack Obama's election, which felt like this high watermark of progressive hope, and then like 2010 and the Tea Party and all that stuff, Donald Trump's election, right now feels like a pretty scarily reactionary moment to me. And you see it on display in a lot of places. And particularly on the day that I'm talking to you now, Katanji Brown-Jackson, who's been nominated to be the first black woman on the Supreme Court, is at her hearings. And, you know, she's been faced with this just like disgustingly racist questioning uh, that has to do about like a distancing herself from the views of other black intellectuals because she's black and reaffirming that she doesn't like crime because she's black. And, you know, you can hear in the subtext questions and not even the subtext, the text, this very ugly, long standing reactionary linkage of blackness and crime questions of particularly crime and public order. And when I think about them, I think about the cauldron of intense racial politics, particularly around crime, law, and order that I grew up with in New York City in the 1990s. Um, A lot of it I wrote about in my second book, uh, A Colony and a Nation, but it's a topic I'm obsessed with because there's so much you can see, even in like liberal New York, in this liberal melting pot city, all of the forces of American politics around these questions of race, identity, crime, public order, conflict, hierarchy are there. They're present in the battles, sometimes literal, like violent battles of, of late 1980s, 1990s New York, Dinkins and Giuliani New York. One of the peak moments in that history, and formative for me, were what are known as the Crown Heights riots, which were days of unrest in a neighborhood in Brooklyn that is a really fascinating, distinct neighborhood. And the reason that makes it so distinct is that it has two principal occupants, Caribbean Americans, racially coded in the United States as black, but folks who are generally first generation or immigrants from the Caribbean, and Lubavitch Hasidic Jews. These are folks who are Orthodox, who attend shul on the Sabbath. They keep the Sabbath. They have incredible lattice work of uh, injunctions from the Torah about what they can and cannot do. An extremely close community there, flourishing. And these two folks, very different worlds and very different life experiences, living next to each other side by side in Crown Heights, that exploded in violence rage and recrimination over a course of basically a week in 1991. And I have long been obsessed and fascinated with Crown Heights because, again, super formative my youth. And so I was so stoked beyond measure when I saw that there was a new podcast just focused on the Crown Heights riots. And the best part was that it was the brainchild and the production of my friend and colleague Collier Meyerson, 
Collier Meyerson is a New York Magazine contributor. She's a Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center, which is a nonprofit journalism organization. And she is the creator, writer, and narrator of Love Thy Neighbor, Four Days in Crown Heights That Changed New York, a five-episode podcast series where she explores her own Black and Jewish identities and also tells the story of the Crown Heights riot. I should note two more things. She is has an Emmy for her work on All In, uh, the show that I host on MSNBC, or she was a producer. She's also married to one of my dear good friends who I've known since I was 12, who's a true mensch. And so all of that aside, biographical stuff aside, the podcast is phenomenal. It's so gripping. The material's amazing. And this is a topic I'm super obsessed with. So it's a great joy to have Collier on the program. Honestly, Chris, I think you're the mensch because you introduced us at your book party. At the book party for A Colony (laughs) Nation, actually, is how you guys met, which is a a great joy and pride of my life to this day. Now, you've got, it's so funny. A mitzvah, a mitzvah. It is a mitzvah, and it's so funny, too, because I'm just working now on my third book, and I was like, I said to Kate the other day, I was like, wow, the last, when the last book, Collier and Evan met at our party, and now they have two kids. Like, it's amazing. So, all right, the podcast is fantastic. This is like nothing could be more directed to like my interest than like this this podcast on on the Crown Heights rides. Maybe let's start with just your experience of like where you're coming from into this story, why you were attracted to it. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there, right? Like I set out to make a series that in nature was incredibly existential, right? Like I wanted to know really what it means to be a good neighbor. And another producer on our show, Jess Jupiter, wanted to dissect what she calls, I love this phrase, the anatomy of a riot. And my co-writer, Noah Remnick, was really interested in the political impact of those four days. So every producer had their own interest. But I think much to the chagrin of everyone, I tend to really like rely on the brains of others to process and work through why stories matter and kind of, like, make something together. I'm, like, a proud dilettante or something, which, (laughs) ironically, I think comes in handy when you're reporting. I know just enough about something to get my foot in the door, and then I, like, really rely on other people that I'm reporting on to tell me where the story goes next. But initially, I think that my interest came from two places. The first is, like you, I'm a native New Yorker. And, you know, my father is this, like, epic Jewish civil rights attorney. And my mother is a Black woman from Philadelphia. The Crown Heights riot had been held up as sort of representative of the breakdown of the Black Jewish alliance in a lot of ways. Like, there is this storied alliance between Blacks and Jews, and this was one of the sort of, like, epic breakdowns of that alliance. And here I had this Black mom and Jewish civil rights lawyer dad who was very much a part of that Black-Jewish alliance, actually quite earnestly, I will say. But there were things about the two communities that actually seemed, like, so different from how I grew up. First of all, the Lubavitch are Hasidic. They have a very particular, as you were saying, way of life. And they're not the Jews that I was used to growing up, who I grew up amongst. The Jews had a sort of, that I grew up with, had a particular interest in civil rights and Black liberation. And that goes the same for the Caribbean American community, too. They were not like the Black people I grew up with. I say in the podcast, like, I grew up on collard greens and macaroni and cheese, and they grew up on macaroni pie. And, um, and you know, that that's just like sort of a surface level difference. But they came from other countries, majority Black countries, Their cultures, foods, and perspectives were totally different than that of my own Black family. So I thought that it was worth it to look into this moment to kind of undo the reductive tale that had been sort of put forth, which was like, this is the fight between Blacks and Jews, between Blacks and whites, um, and kind of unfurl that a little bit. Yeah, and I think one of the things I really love about the podcast both the topic and the way you treat it, is that, like, we're also in this moment where, like, this question, you know, these questions of identity are 
ubiquitous. And particularly the, the slipperiness of all these categories, this, the fact they're socially constructed, the fact that they're refracted through all sorts of different prisms that, you know, they're embedded within each other. So like you're Jamaican, which is different than Trinidadian, but then you're also coded as both just black in, you know, America, but of course, like you're Caribbean, like, and, all, and like, or you're Jewish and like Jewish can mean secular Jew on the Upper West Side who like goes to high holidays and that's about it. Or secular Jew can mean like, you don't touch like light panels or the oven for 24 hours and you live your life under like an incredibly, you know, sophisticated set of biblical injunctions. Like, and those are both like Jews, right? Like in a broad sense, but also like, what do we really mean when we talk about these categories? And in some ways, you know, the show is a real exploration of that because these identities are end up being kind of at this at this friction point. So let's talk about the neighborhood. Let's sort of set the scene of this neighborhood. Because it really is, I have to say, it is a a remarkable place. It's a place I've always loved in New York. It's a beautiful place. Like, physically, it's very beautiful. It really feels not like anywhere else, precisely because of the both the physical nature of it and the makeup of who's in that neighborhood. Like, you feel, you're like, oh, this is not, this is a distinct place. So talk a little bit about where Crown Heights it is and what it is. Yeah, Crown Heights is located in central Brooklyn. It is, as as we've spoken about, a Black community, mostly Caribbean American and Lubavitch Hasidic, which settled in the neighborhood mostly in the 1940s and 50s and stayed after white flight in the 60s. This neighborhood used to consist of secular Jews as well. And there's actually this little kind of like interesting tidbit I heard from a Hasidic Jew who told me, oh, you know, we were more nervous about the secular Jews having an impact on the Hasidim than we were about the Black folks living nearby Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) to sort of secularize our community and have that bad influence. But yeah, so the ethnic whites kind of cleared out except for this one community. And then more and more Black folks started to move in. It was seen for its beauty as the sort of, like, second to Harlem. Harlem had become too expensive. Jews, Black Americans, Caribbean Americans mostly were being priced out of Harlem. So they moved to this beautiful neighborhood with a giant European boulevard that bifurcates the neighborhood. And so one group, the Caribbean Americans, tend to make their lives on the south side of this community. And the Hasidic Jews tend to make their lives on the north side. But there are more Black folks than Jews. So on the north side, there are blocks where it's very, 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 very mixed. Yeah, And you'll hear, like, Jewish music blaring from you know, a kosher bakery, and you'll also see tons of people eating roti or, you know, picking up provisions, ground provisions. It's just a very lively immigrant neighborhood still to this day. And and you rarely find that in Brooklyn still, but obviously gentrification does play a part. Yeah, I mean, it's very time warpy in some ways, and partly because I think of the rootedness of those two communities, even as gentrification has seeped in, that like, there's just like really active, bustling street life. Like, there are people out doing stuff, selling stuff, buying stuff, going to school, you know, going to temple, you know, playing music, like what, like, it's just, it, it has an incredible vibrant life. And you say in the show at one point, like, it is this kind of like brochure, multicultural Brooklyn at its finest, right? Like people living cheek by jowl, very dense neighborhood, old stately architecture. You can get Caribbean food. You can get like, you know, Jewish, traditional sort of Eastern European Jewish provisions. And everyone's mixing with each other at, at a sort of surface level. Yes, for sure. For sure. And so let's talk a little bit about these two communities. And I want to start, let's talk a little bit about the Caribbean American community, which I learned a lot about from this podcast, honestly. These were folks, you say, who sort of came seeking home ownership as a big thing, and whose also self-conception was different than being Black Americans, even if that doesn't really survive contact with American racism after enough time. <laughs> 
Yeah, so Caribbean Americans, much like any other immigrant group to the United States, much like Jews, for example, were coming here seeking a better life, which is sort of hard to imagine a Black group of people coming to the United States seeking a better life or uplift, economic uplift. And then Once they arrived, I spoke to one family who I'm very endeared to, whose great-grandfather came on a boat, a banana boat, uh, as often folks did, and, you know, came and set up a life here. And really what they were seeking was home ownership, which was also a huge deal in their sender countries, the countries from which they came. Having a piece of land meant everything to them much like it does to Black Americans, but I think the promise of America was very different than it was for the descendants of enslaved people in the United States. You also make this point, you have people make the point in it, which is just a, it's an obvious one, but I think still struck me is like, when you're coming from Jamaica, like, there's not really, like, obviously Jamaica is the product of racist colonization and enslavement, but it as a society is a black society in which like there's not like oh well the housekeepers are black but like the people that own are white and the CEOs are white and the you know they're everyone's black uh, so the sort of like color line cast and I remember this line in the there's a great part of the autobiography of Malcolm X where he talks about going to Africa where he has this feeling of like oh wait the pilots are black the pilots of the plane are black like a world is possible in which like all rungs of society are black they're coming in the reverse direction from that to like the insane racial caste system of America. Yeah, and it's not as though there weren't, obviously they are former colonies, so there are white folks abound still. <laughs> Maybe not as many, obviously not as many as there were. Right. It's a, There are majority black countries. Right. And, you know, colorism does obviously exist, all of this. They have their own caste systems, but by and large, they are coming from places where seeing black people in positions of power was not a weird thing. And then you come to the United States and obviously everything becomes a black-white binary and they find themselves on the wrong side of that binary, of course. And also in this situation, which is again a sort of classic immigrant tale of like, I was an engineer in Egypt, I'm an Uber driver in New York, or I was, you know, I I had this level of Oh, educational yeah. social capital, and now I'm you know much lower on the rung of status here in this in this new country I've come. But I'm making the sacrifice like for my kids. So you've got this sort of fascinating mix of like the immigrant striver, this obsession of home ownership, but then the American racial caste system in which they are you know to the police to like white folks in Brooklyn they are black. There's not there's not much more complicated than that. For sure. Um, And also, I spoke with Chris Griffith, who is the brother of Michael Griffith, who was killed famously in the Howard Beach incident for for this podcast because he was a photojournalist who was attacked by the police while he was shooting the riot. And I remember he told me that, and I, and I had, I had this understanding from when I lived in Crown Heights, but he really sort of made it explicit, which was like, oh, we're not necessarily politically aligned with Black Americans Mm -hmm. in the same way that you might imagine we would be because we look the same. And that was like a real, like, aha moment for me. Like, it's a totally different schema, like, politically. So yeah, that was another thing I, I kept in mind while while doing the podcast. And then there's the Lubavitch, who I have to say, like, just going into this as sort of a table setting, I mean, you know, if you live in New York, you encounter different Hasidic communities in different parts of the city. There's a lot of, like, bigotry against them. It's just a lot. Like, there's just a lot of bigotry, a lot of anti-Semitism towards them. Sometimes you hear from, like, secular Jews who, like, say, like, oh, really yeah. not, like, really gnarly stuff. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, people will say stuff about, like, Hasidic folks that, like, it sort of blows your hair back and you wouldn't, like, be said about other communities, honestly. Like, there's this kind of, not to justify it, like, what I want to say is that, like, there is a palpable, quote like, capital D difference (laughs) to these communities, which is just, like, they just look and dress and are living in the world in a very distinct way that is, like, 
extremely perceptually salient, right, to all of their neighbors immediately. It's like if you see Hare Krishna at the airport, right? It's like, those folks are doing their own thing, like, and you're going to notice that, then that noticing could very quickly become, like, really, really gross bigotry and stereotyping. But talk a little bit about this community. Yeah, so I thought a lot of the people in the Hasidic community would be apprehensive about talking to me. And it's true that some were, but on a whole, people were, like, much more open to speaking to me than I ever would have expected. And I think that we can credit that to two things. The first is that this community is known, and I think unfairly so, like you're saying, for being isolationist. It's actually quite the contrary. There's this episode of Sex and the City where Charlotte, who is sort of very absurdly stereotypically guyish character. Mm -hmm. Like, she wears pearls and probably went to Miss Porter's and, like, doesn't talk about her stomach problems the way I do. Right. Um, (laughs) Falls in love with this nebbishy Jewish guy and is trying to convert for him. This is the whole episode. She's trying to convert for this guy because he loves her and she loves him, but he can't marry a non-Jew. So she goes and she talks to a rabbi and says, like, I'd like to talk to you about joining the Jewish faith. And he says, we're not interested. And he closes the door in her face. (laughs) And then it happens like two or three more times. I like actually just recently watched the clip and I was dying. Like, and so that's kind of the reputation that Jews in general have. Like, we're not interested in literally anybody joining our faith. But that's what's so incredible about Chabad, which is... um, it's like, I'll, I'll continue to use Chabad and Lubavitch interchangeably while we talk, um, is that they do proselytize. They proselytize to other Jews. And so it's this very different approach where you like, in my reporting, I came across a guy whose dad was like a jazz musician and then like basically found Hashem. And then I found, mm-hmm. I talked to another guy who is like a super famous rock star in Morocco and was like traveling through the United States and like maybe was stoned and saw in Texas, I'll never forget the story. He like saw some like Jesus sign and he was like, that's a sign for me. And then he he goes and becomes, it's called Baltashuva, like he becomes religious. So this community, you're meeting people from like all different walks of life. Like literally, it's like so fascinating, like from rock stars to like jazz musicians, like anybody goes and they want everyone. So it's a ve- it's not Charlotte from Sex and the City. It's like the opposite. Right. But the, the stereotype is literally the opposite, right? Exactly. That like they're completely exactly. closed off. They're exactly. completely like want to have nothing to do with the outside world. They're impenetrable. This, you know, like that's the way that people, I think a lot of people in New York think about them. Exactly. And so it was actually so much easier than I had anticipated, especially in a pandemic, to access this community. Like there were so many channels and people who were open to talking to me. And, you know, they're like, very technologically savvy. Like, it's like you sort of think like, oh, they're like, must be from the Stone Age. Like, we have so many. Right, or they're like Amish, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, we have so many preconceived notions about this community that I think are extremely unfair and do result in in so much anti-Semitism when all you have to do is really talk to them and they're actually quite open. So, and they, they come, they have a Rebbe who is the, is their sort of like spiritual leader. They come over, he, the the original one's from Belarus, but they're from the, what, the Pale of the Settlement, the part of Eastern Europe in which the, had been sort of recruited Jews from Western Europe in the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, and then had kind of turned the screws on them and sort of contained them there under the Russian Empire, who had lived through all of the stuff of the Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews, both integrated into life there and and outside of it at the same time, pogroms, and then, of course, the Shoah, the the Holocaust. And it's in the wake of the Holocaust that this community comes, you know, in the aftermath of the the murder of of millions and millions of Jews to, to make a new home in this neighborhood that at the time is a kind of Jewish and white ethnic Brooklyn neighborhood, but through white flight becomes a you know, black Caribbean neighborhood and them, but they stay. And not only stay, they like proliferate, right? Like, I mean, it's like they're buying property, they're institutions and schools and temples and stores and a whole, there's a whole 
ecosystem and life world that grows up in this neighborhood. A hundred percent, yes. And yes, they largely came after the Shoah, but they did exist there before in much smaller numbers. And yes, like that's, you're right, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> like they just pr- proliferate and and really like, This is another thing about religious Jews in general is that they tend to make their lives in places like city, like urban spaces, because it's much easier to basically to like walk from your house to shul on the Sabbath when you're not allowed to use transportation or to walk from your house to the grocery store, things like this. A life is needs to be in a dense place. And so that's really A large part of why I think they stayed in Crown Heights when people fled, but also it was because Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who is thought of as kind of a messiah to a lot of folks in the community, also said like, nah, man, we're not, we're not going to leave because people are scared of, of black people. Like, that's not our vibe. Like, we we are mandated to stay here and and live like cheek by jowl like yeah. live among these people and make our lives here with them and that's that's a really sort of powerful powerful move for that moment when so many people who are perceived as white are fleeing cities. Yeah, and you make the point that the white flight that's happening, them staying is not inertia. It's an informed, proactive choice made by the Rebbe and communicated as as essentially a spiritual mandate. I mean, that that, that this is what we're doing. It's not like, well, it's a pain and who can find housing on Long Island? (laughs) Like, it's like, no, we're we're actually doing this and we're staying. You know, I love the, your point about the walkability is so important and key. And if you are ever in New York and you're in this neighborhood and you go to Eastern Parkway on a Saturday, that's like incredible thing of just everyone walking up and down this, you know, European Boulevard and they're walking with, and there's a lot of babies, right? Because there's (laughs) the big family. So it's strollers and it's just a very cool, it's a very beautiful thing to me as someone who's a, you know, urban New Yorker walker by upbringing. So the 1960s and 70s, we see what happens in Brooklyn and, you know, in many urban communities, right? Disinvestment, the sort of post-civil rights kind of retrenchment backlash, a rise in levels of indexed crimes and interpersonal violence that really goes off, particularly in in the U.S. in the 1980s and then towards the late 80s and the 90s. You've got, you know, the homicides going from 300 a year to 2,300 a year at the, at the peak. Crown Heights goes through all this, but with the difference of other neighborhoods in that they have this community of Jews that are have not white flighted their way out. And they come up with different kind of mechanisms to deal with, you know, the the deterioration of public safety. I mean, it really is like a real thing. Like it just gets more dangerous. Talk a little bit about that because that'll segue us into the precipitating incident in 1991. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to kind of like back up a little bit and talk about, of course, there's this whole concept of law and order that has its roots in slavery, but some say that this modern rhetoric around law and order actually stems from the black riots of the 60s, which you just sort of referred to. So like lots of historians are crediting the modern carceral state and police crackdowns, not to like a rise in crime, but to like these black rebellions and challenges to the social and racial order. So like Watts um, in 1965 or Detroit in 1967. And so all of that is happening across the country. And then there are also these dramas playing out in their own municipalities and in their own unique ways. So in New York, there are like so many different versions of this playing out across the years, as you were saying, but because of how dense New York City is and how micro neighborhoods, how many micro neighborhoods there are, they're like playing out in very different ways. And so in Crown Heights, I think, you know, crime rates, which are like obviously socially constructed and contested territory for many different reasons, like you, you can manipulate a crime stat to mean whatever you really want it to mean. But um, 
I think that what was happening in Crown Heights did have a lot to do with people's sense of safety. And that is so important, right? Like, they were feeling for two decades preceding the riot, like, unsafe. And this is across the community. This is Black and and Jewish white white Jews. These are not wealthy people. In Crown Heights, like, these are people responding to -to day-to-day fears in their neighborhood. And we didn't want to shy away from that in the podcast, but we thought it was really important to acknowledge and examine how those fears of crime, which were both real and constructed, led to some pretty interesting and sort of disturbing policing. So there's the shamrim, which is, it means guarding in Hebrew. And they are what the Hasidim would call a community patrol or a safety patrol. And I think a lot of the Black folks in the community would call them a vigilante group or um, sort of an extra, yeah, vigilante. Extra judicial force. Yes, (laughs) exactly. And that only served to escalate tensions. I mean, there were reports of Black people being stopped to show ID. Um, And there's sort of a famous case of a guy named Victor Rhodes who was beaten um, to a pulp by a group of Hasidim. They deny that it was the Shamrim. And this happened in 1978. So the Hasidic community naturally came up with their own way to keep themselves safe. And I don't chide them for that at all, but I think it came... Um, at the expense of their neighbors, who they saw as uh, the threat, the threat, and that yeah, is I mean, the also the very threat. complicated, right? <laughs> right? Because, like, I want to make clear that because of the history of this particular community, who comes, as you say, from the Pale of Settlement, where they experience pogroms not from black people, where they're just like. Straight up, I don't know, Paul Robeson was over there. But besides that, there's, like, not a lot of Black people over in Russia, right? So it's like they're experiencing these— the state-sanctioned violence. That's what this—that's what a pogrom is from other white people. Right, like, and often from and often from neighbors, right? Yes, like the, exactly. The people that you live side by side from day from one day to the next suddenly are like the ones knocking at the door to rouse you out of your house. Exactly, and the key t- word in there is state sanctioned, right? Like the government did not care, did not do anything, right. said it was okay, right. and so there is this really interesting piece of this that took me a very long time to like. <laughs> fully digest and, like, actually come around to, which is that the Hasidic community does not necessarily see their Black neighbors as Black first. They see them as Gayim. They see them as non-Jews. And so there's this really interesting thing where we, as outsiders to this community, want to push upon this community, the black-white binary. Oh, they are having this tension because one is black and one is white. And yes, that definitely factors into it. But first and foremost, the fear that this community has is of people who are not Jewish. Because historically, people who are not Jewish have, like, pillaged, raped, murdered, and, like— expelled them, expelled yeah. them from their land, right? And so that, I think, is a very important part of why they feel like they need a safety patrol, a.k.a. vigilante group, a.k.a., right. you know? So I, I just want to be sort of, like, clear about where that comes from. Well, I mean, and, and it's the reason this is also fraught territory and the reason that's such a great podcast and fascinating topic is, like— everything's sort of more complicated than it looks, right? At first scan, it's like, okay, well, the white folks in the neighborhood band together to, like, have white people patrols to protect them from the black folks. It's like, I kind of know how that goes, and, like, that's not... That's, like, a pretty... Like, both an old American story and a really bad one. But then it's like, no, the people who fled, like, hundreds of years of prosecution and, like, a literal holocaust to make their life in a new home and are, like, literally have stories of, like, persecution passed down through the millennia band together to make sure that, like, their people are protected against 
you know, the possible threats that come from outside the community, which have been, like, that's a totally different story and a totally much more justifiable one and also doesn't squarely fit into black and white racial hierarchy, but has to do with a whole other set of hierarchies and questions of who's the insider, who's the outsider, who's the other, who's the not, who's the person on top of the hierarchy and who's the person on the bottom of the hierarchy. And you're, you've got a world in which everyone in this story has a real legitimate historical claim, right, to kind of being the oppressed or the underdog or the one who's, like, not the one wielding power. Right, right. And yet there's a lot of mutual suspicion. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Rightly so. Because, of course, there is this shamrim. They are very—these are, like, someone pointed out to me, a Hasidic uh, friend of mine said, like, we are very good— um, community organizers. Like, yeah, no one yeah. calls us community organizers, but that we are very good yeah, at that. Course, yeah. And so I think that there was also a very good relationship between the Shamrim, the Maccabees, and the NYPD, right? And the cops, yeah. And I think that that is obviously to the detriment of their Black neighbors. And race certainly factors totally. in there. And I was just going to say, that's where it, like, toggles back around, right? Because it's like, okay— that's their understanding of this and in, in their history and, like, totally defensible and understandable. In the context of America and New York City in the 1990s, the cops are like, oh, those are the white people. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, those are the people that we're going to, like, partner with to, like, make the neighborhood safe and, like, all of the racial baggage that comes with that is present in that. And so, and just to go back one more, just to say one more thing to set up 1991, like, again, I know, like, it's a hard thing because, like, yes, I agree, crime statistics can be Crime as a category is socially constructed, and statistics can say a lot of things. Like, to go back to what you said, like, everyone in the neighborhood is feeling the deterioration of public safety. Like, people are more scared for their persons than they had been, and are not irrationally so. Like, there just is more things to be scared of. Like, keep, there are more incidents. Right, which we can uh, we can trace back to, like, the economy of 1978. Right. And, right. like— people fighting over barely their resources. And, right. you know, so there's, it's not just like, whoopsie-daisy, crime increases, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, there are, like, real historical reasons for why that happens. Yeah. But my point, I guess, is that when you look at this, the history of this neighborhood and, like, why this happens when it does, I do think that, like, the level of fear and sort of, like, just white knuckling that people are doing is at a really heightened level. Like it, it, there just is a lot more, and that is getting everyone in their fight or flight mode. It's getting anyone in their like adrenalized space a lot, because then what happens? It's like all of this kind of comes out in a you know in this sort of rush. So let's take. I want to take a quick break, and then let's talk about what happens in 1991. So in 1991, there's a, basically a car accident is the immediately precipitating event here. Talk me through what happened. A young boy named Gavin Cato was playing on the corner of President Street and Utica Avenue in Crown Heights, which is in the neighborhood, it is part of the neighborhood that is very mixed very Hasidic, very Black. And they're playing on the corner, fiddling with a bicycle, and a three-car motorcade passes through the intersection right there. And one of the cars is carrying the Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who is the spiritual leader of this community. Um, so he he gets a motorcade. One of them has NYPD officers, and the other has his sort of, I don't know, Guys who are protecting him. Entourage. Entourage. And one of the cars veers out of control and hits the young Guyanese immigrants, Gavin and Angela Cato. And Gavin succumbs to his wounds shortly thereafter. But what happens if you sort of slow down this accident, every single part of this community's tension comes to bear, right? So the kids get hit. 
And right on the scene comes Chatzala, which is an ambulance that serves primarily, I would say, pretty much only the Hasidic community. And there's this moment where everyone's saying, well, the kids should go into the Chatzala van, but instead the Rebbe is taken away and so is his entourage. And an EMS truck comes like right away after that. It's like a two minute disparity or something like that. So it's not a very long time, but when you slow this down, it seems like a very long time. So this is the moment where the straw breaks the camel's back, so to speak. Like, all of this tension is now being funneled through the fact that this ambulance didn't take this kid who was dying to a hospital right away. And people just lost it. They lost it. Just to put more on that, I mean, in the whole history you've done, right? So, like, you've got this group that stays a Miss White Flight, but who's also has this history of this kind of like community self-reliance that builds a bunch of parallel institutions to the state <laughs> to like facilitate life in a city that is being disinvested, right? That is the cause of the white flight. So it's like, right, 911 doesn't answer the phone call in like because the city services suck, because the city goes through like an austerity crisis. So like, what's the response? Well, we have a parallel ambulance system. Like they've created these parallel institutions. So now in this moment, right, when like the disinvestment is produced, the kind of world that you're in, and the, the the feeling of precariousness and public safety, like, here's this institution that's a sort of private and parallel that is there and doesn't, and sort of, quote, serves their own, again, from the perspective of the Black folks, I think, in the neighborhood watching this. Right. And also, it's important to remember, too, that there were, to put into context, there were a number of high-profile killings of Black men yeah. at that time. There was Michael Stewart. Um, who was a famous graffiti artist who was killed by police in 1983. My father would actually go on to represent his family in the civil suit. And then in 1986, there was Michael Griffith, who was killed by a white mob in Howard Beach. And that was like, just to be clear for folks that don't know that story, that was just like a straight up lynching that happened in New York while we were, while I was a kid. Like, yeah. like just like a white mob was like, you get out of our neighborhood, we're going to beat you to death. Like just fully straight up. Lynching. And then he ended up getting hit by a car. And my father also represented his family. And then three years later was Yusef Hawkins, who was killed by a mob of 30 white kids. So there's like Spike Lee's yeah. famous movie, Do the Right Thing, that was based on the murder of Michael Griffith. And that almost felt like prescient to the Crown Heights riot, which would happen 30 years later. So there is both internal tension to Crown Heights, but external tension all over Brooklyn. All of these incidents, I think, with the exception of Michael Stewart, took place in in Brooklyn or in Queens nearby. When you say people lost it, like what happens in, what happens subsequently? Well, this, we have to remember there are no cell phones. There is no footage. So it's all word of mouth. And Word of mouth spreads like wildfire in the community and more and more Black people begin to gather in the neighborhood hearing like they left one of ours to die, which of course, understandably, is enraging, Yeah, even though it's not the full Quite, picture, yeah, right? right? But again, like perceptions of of what's going on. And a riot breaks out over the next three days, and it just, there's looting. There is that night, the first night, a young yeshiva student named Yankel Rosenbaum is killed. He's stabbed to death. And and that was obviously the, the nadir. I mean, it was just like, it became the face of, of of the Crown Heights riot, um, his killing. And then it went on and, and there were perceptions among the Hasidic community that the mayor, the first Black mayor, David Dinkins, was not doing anything. He was, quote, letting them vent. That is, 
if you walk around Crown Heights today and you talk to, I would say the majority of the Hasidic people I spoke to said something like, and then Dinkins let them vent. This was like something that they say he said. He never said that. But it's commonly understood that this was a pogrom, right? So coming back to that, that, that Black people were allowed to run, quote unquote, wild in the streets and kill Jews, try to kill Jews, that there was no state to protect them, which of course, you know, isn't true, but I understand that fear. So it was a it was a really, really tense, tense three days. And then at the end of it, of course, Al Sharpton comes in and becomes part of the mix and fears are stoked around his presence because they think, oh, he's bringing in outside agitators, which is a common trope of people who are rioting, of Black people who are rioting, that, like, Black people can't have rage, that it has to be people who are coming from outside of this community to bring the rage in. And... After three days, the NYPD ramps up its force and basically quells the riot and by f- starts on a Monday. By Friday, by Shabbat, everything is uh, pretty much back to normal. What is the aftermath of it? I mean, Dinkins, I remember it was headline news, you know, here. It was, I remember watching the news cover. I mean, it was, you know, overturned cop cars, like the one that's in the image of the, the podcast and, and, you know, looting and, and the Yanko Rosenbaum murder. And it was just everywhere. And it was national coverage, too. It, you know, it was um, the, the eyes of the world were on this at some level. Yeah, I mean, oh man, Dinkins is like a super fascinating whole part of this, right? So the politics of race and violence and policing and rioting in many ways defined the rise of, of David Dinkins, who is, of course, the city's first black mayor. Right. And he came in on the promise that he would offer a sense of racial healing, that his most famous soundbite is that New York was this gorgeous mosaic of different races and religions, and we need to respect one another. He was very mild-mannered. He spoke the King's English, as one interviewee said. All of this to say, he was a very palatable Black man to lead the city. He was, quote-unquote, respectable. Very kind of aristocratic yes. and bearing. He was a sort of product of the establishment machine. Like, just a very kind of, like, regal figure in his— just the way that he conducted himself as sort of physical bearing, the way he talked. It's like a very, you know, almost like a character out of a play or something in the court kind 100%, of hundred percent, hundred percent. And he— Something I didn't know before I started this is that he was also an ardent Zionist and like a champion of Israel and the cause and like causes around Israel. He even started like a group for blacks supporting Israel. Like this guy was, he saw him and he believed in that, like the possibility of a black Jewish alliance in that very sort of like reductive way. And so that's kind of the sad irony of what happened to him, which is that, like, almost immediately after the Crown Heights riot, his detractors, and he had already been portrayed as soft on crime, and even though he actually brought crime down during his tenure, and the media just went with it. I mean, all of these things were playing into his fall. And many, many, many see the Crown Heights riot as the nail in the coffin for Dinkins. Like, for the first two days, the Jewish community felt completely abandoned by him. And so much so that, you know, they, again, viewed this as a pogrom. And so afterwards, it was just a ripe time for Rudolph Giuliani to sweep on in and, you know, exploit this episode in Crown Heights And he basically, I talked to this guy, Alex Vitale, a professor at Brooklyn College, and he said that, like, you know, he really played on the fears of white ethnics in New York. 
of crime and law and order, right? Yeah. And he mimicked the pogrom language, which of course means a very different thing coming from an Italian-American guy than from right, right. the community itself. And he speaks it. But if you're in the community, you like to hear, like, I uh, mean, that, that, yes. that's recognition. Like, I mean, you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And then he he speaks at what became the sort of like infamous city hall riot in 1992. Famously, he says something like, "The morale of the police is so low, and it's so low for one reason only, and that is David Dinkins." And you have like these riotous cops like freaking out, hearing Rudolph Giuliani yeah. say this, holding up signs, racist signs of Dinkins. And so, like, Dinkins was ruined after that. He just became this guy who was, like, soft on crime, who let Black people, you know, vent on the streets of Crown Heights. And his political career was essentially over. It was done. And Giuliani was happy to exploit that. Yeah, not only was his done, but the Giuliani's was... Just propelled into yeah. Ma- yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've seen how much great stuff he's gotten done since. Yeah. <laughs> What's the neighborhood like now? I know you live there. My brother lived there for a while. It's obviously like much of Brooklyn. A lot of it is gentrified. A lot of like, a lot of like young young folks go to wine bars, which is like very much not the scene in 1991. <laughs> like, that's, like you don't have that population back in 1991. But what is it like now? Um, so a lot of the Black community has been displaced or left. I mean, I think it's the same. There is this mentality among, you know, lots of people who come to America where moving to New Jersey or moving to Long Island is seen as a step up from living in Crown Heights. Like, we as, as, New Yorkers through and through might not understand that, but also culturally it's like you've succeeded. So I think it's a it's a it's both that they have been displaced, but also a lot of Caribbean Americans have moved on from Crown Heights voluntarily. So I wanna like make that yeah. pretty clear. And also like I know this is true in Bedstein in lots of places. It's like, you know, people bought brownstones in the ni- you know, early 1980s for, you know, whatever, $25,000, and they're worth $3 million now. You sell them for $3 million, like, a lot of people are like, we can move down to North Carolina, and we can buy, like, four houses exactly. for, like, the whole family can split that up, and we can go live in, like, an acre yard. <laughs> like, it would be, you know, and a lot of people make that make that call. Not a lot of rats. Yeah, yeah fewer, so- fewer rats. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so I think I think we have to keep in mind that New York is a tr- really transient place. It always has been. It always will be. The community has been affected by gentrification in numerous innumerable ways. That being said, the Hasidic community has only grown. I mean, I think there are like twenty thousand Hasidim who live there now, and so it's it's really become this very vibrant, I mean, it is the Mecca, so to speak, of of Chabad, of Lubavitch life. And there are so many, like, it's so funny when you drive down Eastern Parkway, just as like a physical testament to this, like, there are so many newly constructed buildings and like big institutional buildings, like schools and places of worship and community centers, like you see them there and they're like all pretty, like, you know, you can see that these have been built over the last you know, 10 or 20 years, the landscape is very palpably both vibrant and kind of growing and and bustling. And the Chabad sort of community, like, it feels like a a city, like its own city in some ways. Yeah, in a lot of ways it is. And the Caribbean American community is still thriving. And yet, though folks have moved on, there are still tons, no Strand Avenue, is where you'll find all of the Caribbean eats that you want from all of the countries. Uh, There is still the West Indian Day Parade, famous parade where uh, it happens on Labor Day and you just go there, watch the parade, watch these amazing dancers in costumes, like drink a lot, stay up all night, come home with powder on your face from the night before. And... And it's just still this stronghold, in addition to Flatbush, of Caribbean-American life. 
still so many Caribbean American immigrants, first generation, as well as immigrants living in this community. So it's it's still a very much a vibrant Caribbean American community as well. Yeah, it's a really it's a really special place. And and the I was really grateful. I think you are really in a unique position to tell this story and do a great job of it and navigate it really well. I mean, I think because of your own, you know, your own personal upbringing and sort of being in your parents being, you know, Jewish and black, but then also, you know, Evan, and I think we could say this, like Evan is, he's not Chabad, but he's a very, he's a religious and observant Jew. And like these biblical injunctions and and his faith mean a lot to him and, and are part of like, really part of his life and have been for basically essentially as long as I'd known him. I mean, since he was basically a teenager. And so, because I think that like, it's hard sometimes for people on the outside of that to work their way through it and to see it for what it is and kind of to really like inhabit it, you know? And I think that 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 remains the case um, in a lot of these discussions we have sort of across lines of difference, but, but you did a really amazing job. So people should definitely check out Love Thy Neighbor. Thank you. Once again, great thanks to Collier Meyerson, New York Magazine contributor, Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center, which is a nonprofit journalism organization. You can listen to the podcast that she's creator, writer, and narrator of called Love Thy Neighbor, Four Days in Crown Heights That Changed New York, five episodes. You can find it wherever you get your podcast. Also, Collier Meyerson was a former producer on All In. She got an Emmy with us back in the day. We love to hear your feedback on this or any other episode. We really do love to hear from you. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by Donnie Holloway, Tiffany Champion, Brendan O'Melia, engineered by Bob Mallory, and features music by Eddie Cooper from the band Tempers. If you like the music you hear here, well, Tempers is a new album out, and they are on tour, so check them out. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com slash Why Is This Happening. 